Hello and welcome back. Again, you're with Matt Hohan, Captain of Operations at Granbury Volunteer Fire Department. And today, for our Fire Academy, we're going to be covering Fire Behavior, Section 12. And as always, you can jump on sffma.org, go to Certifications, and look for Firefighter 1 and 2. And you can follow through online through SFFMA as you wish. Fire behavior is a class that I've enjoyed teaching for a long time. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you this is going to be a longer class. There's a ton of information that I'm going to be presenting tonight. And I want you to take a ton of notes and I want you to really highlight things that you don't know or you have questions about. Because one of the biggest benefits of having this class in person is I can look at a group when I'm trying to explain something and I can see when something doesn't make sense. Usually represents a whole bunch of blank stares or someone drooling on themselves. This particular case, I'm not going to hear your head and hit the keyboard as you fall asleep or as you start to not pay attention. And I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a fundamental firefighter class. Everything that I'm covering tonight is incredibly important. Not for just your knowledge, but also for your safety. We're going to be covering everything that has to do with your safety and how a structure burns. As our slideshow starts tonight, I want you to look at the picture that's on your screen right now. And I'm going to be referencing the pictures on your screen a lot tonight. And I'm going to be referencing the house in the way that we would actually look at the structure on scene. I see a two-story house, heavy smoke, heavy fire, and it's showing out of the first floor right now. And my references to fires tonight is always going to be to the picture that's currently on the slide. And with to this slide, I'm going to ask you this question. What exactly is heat? What exactly is fire? I want you to think about it and I want you to write that answer down. When I'm done talking, you can click on the slide again and the answers will come up. But I want you to come up with your own answer to start. So the answer to define heat and fire. Fire is a chemical reaction. That sounds like a really coy answer, but at the end of the day, all fire is is a product of a chemical reaction. You have a fuel source, whatever's burning. You have heat that was applied to it to start the fire. And you have oxygen to sustain the reaction. Now, heat is a byproduct of an exothermic chemical reaction. So heat and fire are directly tied to each other. Identifying heat sources. There are many ways to start a fire and this is the point of ignition. The purpose of this slide is just to help to identify that there's many many ways to physically start a fire. Get the fire going. The first one we're going to look at is mechanical energy. Example I'm going to give you is just think of an engine running with a loose fitting belt. That belt's going to create friction. The friction's going to build up heat. And that is our heat source for mechanical energy. Now, thermal energy is kind of a given. We already have a heat source. It may be an electrical heater, it may be a campfire, and we're just having a massive heat buildup from another heated source. A third one is electrical energy. You can have a lightning strike, you can have a short and a piece of electrical equipment. Um, there's many variations of electrical energy sources for a point of ignition. Fluid power is unique. In this area, we don't have much experience with hydroelectric dams, but if you're using a turbine and you have a fluid pushing that turbine, you can potentially build up a heat source just from the turbine itself spinning. But that's also going to be mechanical energy. We're not going to worry and focus too much on fluid power because we just don't have much of it in our area. Now, chemical energy is a big one. 
Think of anything on a Walmart truck. If I take two products and just mix them together, they may react, they may not. But that's also a potential chemical energy source. Solar and light energy, that one's pretty easy. If we take a, something like a magnifying glass and focus a beam of light on a piece of paper, we're literally using the sun to start a fire. Nuclear energy is a prominent one just because of the local power plant. We have the potential of radiation and its ability to be very hot in starting a fire. And the last one's kind of unique and definitely not common in our area, but you can use sound energy. As sound is being created, those are just big waves, and those waves can create enough friction to start a fire. The fire triangle and fire tetrahedron. This is the chemical reaction to have a sustained fire, and we're also going to examine it how to extinguish a fire. Now we have two diagrams here, one on the left and one on the right. One is the older method at how fire science was taught, and the one on the right is just the new method. We're going to start with the one on the left, and it's a really basic concept. To be able to have a sustaining fire, you have to have heat, you have to have oxygen, and you have to have fuel. And that is what's needed to be able to sustain a fire. Now the modern day tetrahedron is what we're using for fire science. And what we're going to really look at in not only the fire science side of it, but also the extinguishment theory, is the tetrahedron. The heat, that is generated from our point of ignition, our source. Okay. You have to have a sustained heat. So the fire has been ignited, but once it's been ignited, the fire has to continue to give off heat. The second thing is the fuel. You have to have a constant fuel source. Once the fuel's gone, the fire itself will be extinguished. Oxygen. You have to have a prescribed level of oxygen to be able to sustain the fire. The middle part, the last part of the triangle, the chemical chain reaction. The chemical chain reaction is the actual fire. So once you have heat, once you have fuel, and you have oxygen, you now have a sustained chemical reaction, and that is the fire. Fire extinguishment theory. So off of the fire tetrahedron or the fire triangle, if we can take the heat out, stop oxygen, remove the fuel, or physically attack the chemical chain reaction, we should be able to immediately extinguish the fire. And this is what we're going to go into detail on. For fire extinguishment theory, we're going to first look at temperature reduction. My question to you is, is what is the most readily available thing for us to use to actually extinguish a fire for temperature reduction? That's water. Water is our best product for cooling. Water, when it hits something burning, is physically going to cool the surface that's actually burning at this time. That heat reduction is going to help extinguish the fire. Extinguishment by fuel removal. Fuel removal is difficult. When something's physically burning, I'm going to give you an example of just a campfire. How do we take the fuel out of the equation? If I just grab a burning log and move it, then all I've done is move the burning log. I have now have two separate fires, one smaller in the piece of fuel that I removed, and still the remaining campfire that was already burning. I want you to look at fuel removal as more of an isolation technique. We will physically isolate the fuel. If we can contain the fire to just the one subject that's burning and isolate it from other fuel sources, then we can focus on other techniques to physically remove the fuel. Let's say it's a liquid fire. How am I going to remove the liquid that's under the burning surface? Well, that's going to be incredibly difficult. Physically removing the fuel is going to be very difficult on a solid fire or a liquid fire. But what about a gas burning? Let's say it's a propane tank that's burning off. If I physically turn the tank off, I've literally turned the fuel off to the fire. So removing the fuel 
from a fire is situational specific. It's not necessarily easy to do for a solid fire. It's almost impossible to do for a liquid fire. But for a vapor fire, a gas fire, if I can physically seal the container, I can turn the fuel off and remove it from the fire. Now, extinguishment by oxygen dilution. How am I going to take oxygen away from a fire? Well, chances are you've actually already seen this and maybe even practiced it at home. If you're at home, you're frying some eggs or some bacon or maybe chicken fried steak. or And the fire, the grease fire, literally catches. Well, how do we extinguish that fire? Well, we grab a lid from another pot or we grab a good old dish rag and we cover the fire up real quick. That is a creating a barrier and it's going to literally isolate the fire under the towel. And what it's going to do is consume all the oxygen under the towel or under the lid. And it's going to burn itself out because there's no more oxygen left. But again, this is situational. How are we going to take a house fire and eliminate the oxygen from that fire? Are we going to take a giant glass bowl and lift it in the air and put it over the structure so it can consume itself? Well, no, that's not an option. Let's go to a very advanced type of firefighting where they use explosives on oil wells that have caught fire. They use an explosive, they create a giant fireball, and it consumes all the oxygen in that immediate area, and it snuffs the fire out really quick. Are we going to be able to do that in town? Are we going to be able to do that in the county? No. Using oxygen dilution or reducing the oxygen from the fire is very difficult and it's really not practical for any type of fire that's larger than what can be covered with a simple lid or just a simple fire blanket. Extinguishment by chemical flame inhibition. This is very hard to do, but there are firefighting products out there that you can physically attack the chain reaction. You're not going after fuel, you're not going after oxygen, and you're not going after the temperature reduction. You are physically attacking the chain reaction of the flame itself. Unfortunately, in our area, that process is incredibly expensive. It's very hard to do, and you're really only going to find it in high-end industrial and also high-end commercial or laboratory settings. For us and locally, our most common type of fire extinguishment is going to be use of water. But also, don't forget, if you can turn a valve off to extinguish the fire by isolating the fuel or contain the fuel, do that. And if it's a small enough fire, don't forget, you can always try and cover it. Characteristics of water as it relates to fire extinguishing potential. Now, really what I want you to consider is why water is so awesome and why firefighters around the planet use water. And I want you to write down a couple of reasons of why you think water is so good for use in firefighting. Go ahead and write those down. Now, the reason that firefighters use water so commonly in firefighting, and there's several, let's go over the very first one. Water is abundant. 75% of the planet is covered in water, and whether you're in the middle of the desert or in the mountains or in the middle of Texas, you have a water source relatively close to you, whether it be from a lake, from a river, or even the water that's under our feet. Water is very prevalent. Now, another reason. Water has fantastic principles when heat is being applied to it. Water has a very low boiling point, 212 degrees, and once water starts to boil, it turns to steam. Water from a liquid to a gas expands at a rate of 1,700 to 1. So you could use one gallon of water Turn it into steam, and it's going to be 1,700 gallons of steam. Here's the really cool thing about this, though. Even though the water's a steam in the air, it's going to continually absorb heat. It is going to suck the heat out of the entire atmosphere 
in a structure. Now, of course, as water heats up from a steam state and it continues to get hotter and hotter, it's going to rise to the top of the room or near the ceiling. So it's going to continually absorb heat. Another reason water is commonly used is it's easy to move. It's easy to put in a tank and store. It's easy to pipe. And it doesn't require anything special to contain it. You can store it in plastic. You can store it in metal. You can store it underground. It's just easy to move. Lastly, water's cheap. Being such an abundant material on the planet, it's everywhere. And because it's everywhere, it's cheap. Define the following stages of fire development. Incipient, growth, flashover, or backdraft, fully developed, decay. Guys, this is a really long slide, and there is a lot to talk about. I'm going to be referencing the picture in our slide quite a bit. An incipient stage, or the ignition point, they're the same thing. It's where the fire started. Once the fire is self-sustaining, then we immediately go into the growth phase. And you can see in the picture in the top left, you see an incipient stage. The fire's definitively started in that room. There's not a lot of smoke. There's almost no heat coming off, and you can barely see the fire tucked away off by the couch. But as the fire starts to grow, more heat and more smoke is going to be generated. And this is where things become important to us as a structure firefighter. These stages of growth that I'm going to be covering, I'm going to be referencing a container or the structure. It's the same thing. In this particular case, the walls and ceiling of our container, they're going to be holding in the heat and they're going to be holding in the smoke. So as that fire gets hotter and bigger, it's going to start giving off more smoke. That smoke is critical for the overall development of the fire. Now, if you look at the picture at the top right, you will see a very definitive smoke layer, and you will see that it's still clear. What we're seeing there in the middle, and you barely see in the picture, it says neutral pane. That neutral pane is the layer between the smoke and between the layer of air coming in to feed that fire. The smoke is going to be ejecting from the compartment, and the airflow is going to be into the fire. And the heat is going to continue to build at the roof. And you can see in our picture that fires actually started to get pretty big. Now, if we go to the bottom left, you can see that that fire has grown quite a bit. There's still a large column of smoke pushing out of the window, out of the door at this time. It even looks like there's a volume of smoke pushing out pretty hard. But you still see a very definitive clear area beneath the smoke layer at the neutral plane. That clear air is coming in to continually feed the fire. And if we look at the fire, we can see that the fire itself's gotten substantially bigger. It actually looks like that part of the floor is on fire and now possibly even the couch is on fire. When we get to the next stage, flashover. Flashover is when the smoke in the room ignites. Flashover is really critical to us because the temperature in the room prior to flashover is going to be anywhere between 800 and 1200 degrees. But once the smoke in the room ignites, we're talking about temperatures of up to and over 1800 degrees. As soon as flashover has occurred, the smoke is on fire, there's going to be a massive release of heat inside that room and it's going to cause everything else to actually catch on fire so the walls will be on fire the floor is on fire all the contents of the room are on fire and you've immediately immediately leapfrogged to the next stage fully developed so the fire is fully developed right after flashover once the fire is fully developed it'll continue to consume all the materials in that room until finally 
they start to finally no longer have any fuel left and you are starting the decay phase. And the decay phase can last for minutes or it can last for hours. It can last for days. And the best example I can give to this to you is think of just a simple campfire. Even if a campfire has, doesn't have any visible flames, it can still be glowing in red hot charcoals for hours. That's a decay phase. Four methods of heat transfer. Guys, what we're going to talk about from this point is how does a fire start as a simple little cigarette fire next to a couch and then ultimately spread from not only just involving fire in that room, but completely across the entire house. And what we're going to start with is conduction, convection, radiation, and direct flame impingement. And to use an example, we're going to look at this picture at the top right. And we have a guy holding a pot of water over a fire. Now, conduction is whatever is in physically contact with the hot object and then that heat is slowly going to spread down that object. In this case, the pot of water over the fire and the handles connected to the pot. As the pot continues to heat up, the heat is going to move down the handle. That's conduction. Convection is a current. We always know that heat rises and cold will sink. So if we look at our pot of water, the water on the bottom of the pot closest to the fire, it's going to start to heat up and that water is going to rise in the pot. The water at the top that's cold is going to sink to the bottom and what's going to happen is that cold water is going to warm up, it's going to rise to the top and cold water from the top is going to sink back down and be warmed up. That's a convection current. Radiation. Radiation is best described as a 360 degree sphere. Radiation heat can be felt from a top of the fire, next to the fire, underneath the fire. Radiation is direct line of sight with whatever's hot. Direct flame impingement is whatever's physically in the fire. If we put the pot literally on top of the coals and in the fire, that is direct flame impingement. How do these transfer methods affect fire spread in structures? We're going to go over the exact same four heat transfer methods. I'm just going to talk about it in relation to an actual structure now. We're going to start with conduction. If you have a fire in a corner of a room, and in that corner, what's in the walls? Well, you have electrical wires, you have, you have wall studs, and you potentially even have pipes. All of those things, even though the sheetrock's in the way, is somewhat exposed to different types of heat methods coming through the wall. Now, if that wire or a water pipe or even the wall stud starts absorbing heat, they can carry the heat through conduction. And as that wire continue to heat up, that heat's going to continue to move down the wire or a pipe or a wall stud or whatever is physically in contact through conduction. Fire spread is very common through this. That's why if you ever do have a structure fire and that fire is next to a wall, you need to tear the sheetrock out and you do need to look at the wires and you do need to look at the wall studs and you need to see exactly how far that fire actually traveled. Now, just a side note, after you've torn sheetrock out, the question is, is how much sheetrock do you tear out? Once you find one black stud, just go to the next blackened stud in the wall. Once you finally pull enough sheetrock out where you see no fire damage, no scorch marks, no charring, you can stop there. There is no other progress of conduction down the wall. Let's go to convection. Convection is primarily something that is affects the smoke and is moved by the air currents in the room. It's a major contributing factor for fire spread. We already know that the fire's hot. We know that the heat's going up. We already know the fire's producing smoke. Because the fire's producing smoke, it's also going to be hot, and we know that it's going to go up. That heat 
it trapped in the smoke and the air. As it gets to the walls, it's going to transfer some of that heat to the wall. Also, as it gets to the ceiling, it's going to start transferring some heat into the ceiling. Anything that's on a ceiling or on a wall is going to start absorbing the heat from the smoke. Now, as the structure or the container starts to fill up, you now have a big pocket of hot air trapped up there at the ceiling. And that air is in physical contact with the ceiling now. And through conduction, the heat itself is going to start being absorbed into the ceiling. And through convection, heat's going to start being absorbed into the ceiling. Convection is a major contributing factor to how fire spreads so quickly. Let's talk about radiation next. Radiation is a major contributing factor, but remember, it's line of sight. You have to be in the same room line of sight for radiation to be a factor. If you have a fire in the corner of the room, anything that's in line of sight of that fire is going to be affected by radiant heat. But also distance is a factor. If I'm in the opposite corner of the room, I may not feel much radiant heat from that fire. But if I'm standing directly next to it, I feel a ton of radiant heat coming off the fire. That radiant heat is going to be dumping into the floors, it's going to be dumping into the walls, and it's going to be dumping into the ceiling. All of those factors are critical because we've already learned that as a subject becomes heated, it's going to start off-gassing. The more off-gassing that it creates, the higher potential for it becoming flammable. This is how heat transfer affects structure fires. The last one is direct flame impingement. Direct flame impingement is kind of implied. If I have a couch and I throw it in the fire and it's literally in the fire, well, the direct flames will catch the couch on fire. Now, if you have any questions, make sure you write them down and ask someone at your department or grab one of the instructors and ask them a question. Three physical states of matter on which fuels are commonly found. Those are going to be solid, liquid, and gaseous. And the reason we need to talk about this is we, we're really going to be going into more detail on not only just how the fire spreads, but how it actually affects the structure. Uh, where we're going to really get into this, understanding this, is I'm going to ask you these two questions, and then I'm going to give you the answer in a second. First question is, is what is the only state of matter that burns? And my second question is, how can you tell if that state is present? I want you to write down those answers, and then I'll tell you here in a second. Now, before I get to answering the questions, I want to take a second and talk about the three different states of matter and how those three states relate to each other. Now, we, I'm going to use the reference of a block of water, frozen. It's an ice cube. Okay, As ice melts, it literally turns into a liquid, liquid water. Okay, How did that ice melt? Well, it warmed up. So if I warm a block of ice up, it's going to melt into a pot of water. Now, as I take that pot of water, if I continue to heat it up, it's going to vaporize, it's going to gas off, and it's going to turn into steam. Okay, I can take that same steam, cool it, and it'll turn into liquid water, or if I cool it further, it'll turn back into a block of ice. This is a really important step in how the off-gassing process begins. A solid can sublimate into a gas. I'm going straight from solid, straight to gas. That's sublimation. I, if I cool the gas quick enough, I can go straight from a gas right back to a solid. And we're going to go into a lot more detail here in the next couple of slides on this. Now, back to the questions. What is the only state of matter that burns? If I asked you this and we were looking at a campfire, you would probably look at a log and you would say the log is burning. 
And I would tell you, no, the log is not burning. What is burning is the gases released from the log. Those gases are released because the log's being heated up, and those gases are what's physically burning. A solid does not burn. A liquid does not burn. The only way you can have a fire is from the gaseous state. Now, how can you tell if that state is present? Don't overthink this. If you see smoke, you see fire gases. That's how you see that state present. Now that I've got you scratching your head, this slide's really good at showing you at how that process happens. And the process that we're talking about is called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is how solids burn. And in our picture here, what we have is a real simple match. Okay, and we're going to take you through all the stages of a fire just through the simple strike of a match. When the match is struck against the box, the match head drags across the box. That creates friction. The friction is enough to cause the chemicals on the match head to ignite. That ignition process is what starts the growth phase. You've got oxygen around the match head. You now have heat by the, the chemicals on the match head. And the fuel source is the physical match itself. Once that process starts, the rest of the match is literally going to start heating up. It's going to start absorbing heat through conduction. It's going to also start absorbing heat through a little bit of radiation. Now, convection's not going to be a factor on a match, but you're going to have conduction and you're going to have radiation being absorbed into the unburned portion of the match. Those unburned portions of the match, they are going to heat up and they are going to start releasing gases that are trapped inside the wood. That process is called off-gassing. Once those gases are released from the wood, once enough energy is built up into the wood, that gas is going to come off the wood and it's going to be right next to the match head that was fresh fire. And that fire is going to leap to those fire gases. And that fire is going to continually march down the match as long as you're holding it. And it will burn all the way to the very end of that match until it's consumed all the off gases out of that match. And that is the same process at how a structure fire works. A match is just at a much smaller level, but it's easy to see. That is how pyrolysis works. This is how solids burn. The solid itself doesn't burn. It's the gases that come from the solid that burn. Here's something really crazy. Everything out there burns. Obviously wood burns. Obviously paper burns. Plastics burn. Steel has a burning temperature. Everything out there has a point at which it will be turned into a gaseous state and it can be burned. Vaporization. This is how liquids burn. What we're going to go into is the basic process in how you take a liquid and it becomes flammable. Now, I'm going to make a statement and I'm not encouraging you to do this. In fact, get your friend to do it and you can film it and then you can send the video to me. You could take a road flare, get a 55 gallon drum of jet fuel, take the road flare, submerge your hands in the road in the jet fuel, strike the road flare, and guess what? You're not going to blow up. And here's why. Because there's no vapors. You are trying to ignite the road flare in a 100% rich atmosphere of a liquid. Now you take your road flare out of the liquid, lift it a few inches above the get the actual jet fuel, strike the flare, and then you might have fireworks. Vaporization works by the gas layer coming off the top of the liquid. Now, 
there's a couple of different ways that you can get a gas layer to come off of a liquid. Evaporation is one method. You can physically heat a, met- a liquid and get it to start boiling. That's another method. All of those can result in vaporization. But once the vapor has actually started to lift off the surface of the liquid, you now have the potential to have fire, much less a sustained fire. Once that fire is actually lit on top of our barrel of jet fuel, think about the heat. All that heat that's being produced at the top of the barrel, where is it going? Well, you have a little bit of conduction, not much, through the physical sides of the barrel. The heat that's going to be coming off the gas is going to be going into the physical barrel, and the barrel is going to start absorbing heat. As it absorbs more and more and more heat, that heat is going to be dumped back into the jet fuel, and it's going to be warming the jet fuel up faster to a point where it can boil quicker or evaporate faster. Another really significant factor is radiation. The physical heat that's radiating from the fire, that's going to have a major impact on liquids. This next slide is one of my favorite slides to discuss. I want you to go home tonight and tell your significant other or your parents that your fire instructor taught you a new four-letter F word. And then I want you to tell them fuel. I want you to take a serious note on the way that we look at smoke and what smoke really is. I've already talked about it earlier, but we're going to go in a lot more detail on this. Okay? Anytime you see smoke, I want you to immediately connect to the fact that it is fuel. It will always be a fuel, and it is a fuel that is hot, and it is a fuel that is already in a gaseous form, and it is a fuel that is at its most dangerous presence and state. The smoke is how the fire grows so fast inside containers. Smoke is how the fire spreads so fast inside containers. And smoke is what's going to kill you inside a container fire. I can assure you this. If you're inside a room and your biggest concern is going to be what you're looking at and it's going to be that pile of burning stuff in the room. And I can tell you this. What's going to kill you? The biggest surprise in the room. The biggest monster is going to be the smoke. The smoke is fuel, and I want you to always be concerned about the smoke. We're always going to reference the smoke in the atmosphere, and it's the atmosphere that I want you to really be paying attention to when you're doing your interior firefighting. Let's take a look real quick at the picture on this slide. The smoke is going to tell me a lot about what's going on with this structure. And we're going to talk a lot more in a later class on how to use the smoke to our advantage in telling us a story. But I can tell you from this picture and looking at the smoke that the density of the smoke tells me it's a very intense fire inside. There's a lot of stuff being exposed to high temperatures that's releasing a lot of off-gassing that's producing all this smoke. The color of the smoke is telling. If we look at the very center of the picture, you can see a little jet of smoke, and it's black at the roof, but once it gets outside of the roof, it changes color. The velocity, I can tell that that's a fast chugging smoke. It looks like it's leaving the structure quickly. It's not just lofting out and kind of seeping out of the house. You can tell that it's being pushed very hard. The last part of this is the volume. There's a massive volume of smoke with this. This is just the total column. All of these factors tell me a lot about the fire that's inside the structure, and I don't have to be inside to know that that's a large fire. Hazard of a finely divided fuels as they relate to the combustion process. What we're really talking about here is surface to mass ratio. And what I want you to look at is the picture at the bottom left. What you see is a couple of crazy lumberjacks standing next to a massive redwood tree that they cut down. 
Now that redwood tree, I want you to look at it and I want you to think about the physical surface area on the outside versus the weight of the tree. There's hundreds of thousands of feet inside that tree that's not exposed. So the surface area is very small while the mass of the tree, the weight of the tree, is very high. Why is that a factor? Well, let's go into a little more detail on that. Think of it as how hard it would be to actually light the tree on fire. If I took a small campfire and set it next to that tree, would I ever be able to get that tree to catch on fire? The answer is no. I might be able to get the bark to burn a little bit, but I'll never be able to get enough energy from the campfire to soak into the tree to then be able to actually expand the wood enough to start producing off gases. So let's step up our bow game a little bit. Let's say we go after the tree with a blowtorch. Is even a blowtorch going to be enough to do more than just burn the bark a little bit and maybe char the surface a little bit? It's the same result. It's just not enough energy that can be put into that tree to ultimately get it to actually start off-gassing. Now, let's say we have a forest fire. A massive fire with massive trees around it on fire. Is there enough energy there to soak into our big tree to potentially start off-gassing? Yes. Once you have a fire large enough, you can probably start catching objects this dense on fire. A thing to consider, though, is once something this large is on fire, how the hell are you going to extinguish it? Is a fire truck going to put that out? Is a fire truck connected to a hydrant going to put that out? No. The only way you're going to be able to extinguish this tree is push it into the Pacific Ocean. Now, let's go on the exact opposite side of that. Let's look at the bottom right. We have a giant pile of sawdust. Now, when we take it one sawdust particle... That piece of wood barely weighs anything, right? But if we look at that sawdust and its weight in comparison to its surface area, it has a massive surface area to its weight. So how much energy do I have to be able to put into that piece of sawdust to be able to catch it on fire? Well, almost nothing, because the entire weight of the object is basically surface area. So... A really light object or a really heavy object is entirely dependent upon its surface area. If you have a high surface area to mass ratio, you're going to be able to catch that object on fire very easy. It's also going to be able to be extinguished very easy because once you get water on it and water starts to coat, it's going to coat the host surface quickly, and it's going to cool quickly. Now, take a second. I want you to think about this question. How does a very dense house, something like a log cabin, how is it going to burn versus how a typically constructed house off of 2x4s and 2x6s is going to burn? I want you to write down your answer. On this slide, this is just another slide to emphasize surface to mass ratio on the left side. And we'll talk about the right side of the slide in a second. Um, this is just a good example of showing that surface to mass ratio and the ability to physically get an ignition point on the object. Um, and it's corresponding to just what we were talking about in the previous slide. Now the slide on the right is fire spread as a function of to position and this is critical to us and and easily explained with the picture on the right we're going to look at the top one with the horizontal piece of plywood so if i take a piece of plywood that's laying horizontally and i light a corner on fire how long is it going to take to actually burn that entire piece of plywood it's going to take an incredibly long time why well think about this if the wood's laying perfectly level, and we're t talking about fire spread and the methods of fire spread, is radiation a factor? A little bit. The only radiating heat you're getting is off the corner that's actually burning. Outside of that, you're getting no radiation heat. 
you're getting very small exposure from radiation. Well, what about conduction? Well, same thing. You only have one tiny corner of the wood that's connected to the rest of the piece of plywood. So the conduction factor is also very small. And convection's not going to be a factor on this fire spread at all. But if I take that piece of wood and I change its position and I rotate it 90 degrees where it's standing vertically and I take a lower corner of that piece of wood and I light it on fire, all of a sudden I have multiple factors now affecting fire spread. Even though I've only lit the fire in one corner of the piece of wood, the fire is going to be radiating across the surface of the wood now. And that fire is going to be able, the heat is going to travel up. So I'm getting conduction, or co correction, convection that's now affecting the actual fire spread because I'm heating the wood that's above the bottom corner. And then lastly, with conduction, it's the same factor. I only have a small corner of the wood on fire, but I actually have a large portion of the wood that's still not physically connected to the fire yet. But radiation and convection are major factors in fire spread. So position of what's burning is critical. If it's laying horizontally, it's a pretty easy fire to extinguish. If it's vertically, Everything that's below the point that's burning is being affected by radiation and convection. And everything that's in front of the fire, or in this case above the fire, is all being preheated. And that just means it's going to off-gas faster. Three products of combustion commonly found in structural fires which create a life hazard. So my question to you is I want you to name three things that are inside this picture you're looking at. If you were standing inside that structure, what are three things in there that can potentially kill you? I want you to write those three things down and then we'll give you the answer after you click on the next slide. Now I'm going to hopefully give you several examples of life hazards that are created inside a structure fire. So if I'm standing in there without any protection whatsoever, the first one is, is I'm going to be exposed to a massive amount of heat. And that's pretty obvious. I bet you guys wrote that down as one of your answers. Another one is going to be smoke. There's just a ton of smoke that's created inside that structure. And along with the smoke, I'm also going to have a low oxygen environment because the fire is going to be consuming the vast majority of the oxygen, oxygen but also the smoke's going to displace the oxygen. A fourth factor is just the toxic atmosphere. Forget the heat, forget the low oxygen. Think about the crap that you're actually breathing at this point. You are literally breathing burnt couch. You are literally breathing burnt carpet. So the toxicity of the atmosphere is a major factor. Thermal balance and imbalance. This is something that you'll see pretty regularly as you advance your career as a firefighter. This is very commonly found when you arrive on scene and you're making entry into the structure and what you're going to have is a smoke layer at the ceiling and you're going to have a very clear area below the smoke. And the way that developed is, is obviously we know that the heat travels up and the smoke is hot. So the smoke's going to go to the ceiling and once it hits the ceiling it's going to fan out. But the room is going to start filling with smoke. So as the room starts to fill with smoke, it's going to possibly go out a vent point. Maybe it's a front door left open or possibly a window. That's also another vent source for air coming in to feed the fire. So when you have a very well-established thermal balance, you also have a very solid flow pattern that's allowing the fire to grow unchecked. It's actually a very bad thing. Now, it's very easy for firefighters because if you're standing up and in the smoke, you can squat down or crawl and it'll be perfectly clear. The other benefit of that is, is you'll be out of the heat. 
when you get down into that clear airflow that's going to the fire, feeding the fire, the temperature is also going to drop. Not only because the heat's up high, but the air coming in is from a much cooler source. That is the thermal balance. Now, a thermal imbalance is perhaps when the front door is closed or the window is closed, and that air and smoke at the ceiling is allowed to just build up in the room, and it's going to dam up on the walls, and it's ultimately going to come cascading down. It's also going to have a lot to do with how much oxygen is being consumed in the room. If all that oxygen is being consumed in the room, we're also taking any possibility of a stream of air coming in that's continually allowing the fire to grow. And what's going to happen is that smoke's just going to fill that entire space. Another way you can have a thermal imbalance is you're making advance into the structure with your hose. You and your crew realize that it's hot and you want to actually cool down the atmosphere around you. So you take the hose, you point it up at the ceiling, and you squirt water. Well, the water leaving the hose goes to the roof area where it's hot at the ceiling, and the water's instantly going to steam. Well, the water steamed because it absorbed a bunch of heat out of the atmosphere. That, that layer of steam and smoke that's now been cooled is cool to the area relatively around it, and that heat is going to drop because it's cooler. It's going to drop to the floor. And it's going to happen really quick, and that's going to create an imbalance. Unfortunately, if you do it too much, you can actually turn the whole room to the inside of what looks like a milk jug. You'll have absolutely zero visibility, and you'll actually have a lot of heat from the ceiling that drop down on top of you. It can be very uncomfortable when you encounter it. I want to talk about thermal balance just real quick because I was referencing neutral plane earlier. Neutral plane is the barrier in between the clear air, clear cool air down below, and the making entry going to the fire, and then the upper layer, which is the fire gases and hot smoke that's leaving the structure. That's the neutral plane. Now for a couple of definitions. SFFMA has deemed it important that you guys go over these definitions and at least have an explanation of them. Flashpoint. The temperature at which a particular organic compound gives off sufficient vapor to ignite in air. What we're really trying to say here is the flashpoint is the product of smoke is created. In other words, you've heated a substance enough, it's now starting to off-gas. It's starting to create smoke. The next one, fire point. The lowest temperature at which a combustible substance continues to burn in air after its vapors have been ignited. Fire point is where the fire has become sustained. It's going to start growing from the fire point on. Next, the ignition temperature. The lowest temperature at which a combustible substance, when heated, takes fire in air and continues to burn. This is the ignition temperature is the incipient stage of the fire. It is where we were able to to start the fire at. Now, we're going to cover upper and lower explosive limits, and this is something that's really critical for us to understand, because not all things that off-gas and not all those gases are flammable in the same ranges. And if we look at our explosive limits charts, the first one at the top is methane. Methane is only flammable with a mixture of 4.4% to 15 percent. So if you were standing in an atmosphere that was 50 percent oxygen and 50 percent methane, even if you had some idiot dancing with a road flare out there, it's not going to explode. The mixture is too rich. You're not at the explosive limits. And it has to be on the lower level at 4.4 and a maximum of 15. Now let's go to another uh, component. Let's go down to hydrogen. The lower explosive level limit of hydrogen 
is a minimum of 4%, but you can have as much as 80% in the atmosphere for the upper explosive limit. So two completely different gases, both of them are very volatile, and both of them have completely different limits at which they will possibly catch fire and potentially explode if you have a large enough pocket of gas. If you have any questions off of this, make sure you write your question down. Concentrations of oxygen in air as it affects combustion. This is really important for us to understand, and I'm going to give a real basic example that most people understand with this. You think of this as an engine for this explanation. If I have an engine that's running too rich, in other words, it's getting too much fuel, the engine won't run right or it won't even run. But I can also go on the exact opposite extreme. If I take too much fuel away or don't give the engine enough fuel, it won't run or it won't run properly. I have to be in the proper mixture of enough gas and enough air to be able to have that engine run properly. This is the exact same concept that it takes to actually be able to sustain a fire. And we're talking about oxygen concentrations with a fire. You have to have the right amount of oxygen for a fire to be able to sustain a combustion process. All the previous slides that we've talked about all lead up to this one particular graph, modern fire development. And I'm going to go through this graph in great detail, and I want to talk about how it affects us as firefighters. Now, this graph is based off a of temperature, and it's based off a of time. And this fire is going to start at the ignition point. It's the incipient fire. Okay. Once the fire is started, and incipient happens and it starts to grow, now time starts and temperature is going to start rising. Now, you'll see on our graph that as time progresses, temperature is going to increase. And then as we get to the first peak on the graph, it says the fire's underventilated. What we're saying is, is our house fire, our container fire, there's no openings. The front door is not open. There's not a window open. There's no source of full free-flowing oxygen for the fire. And what's going to happen is, is the fire inside the structure is going to consume a ton of the oxygen inside the house. And because of that, you're going to see a decrease in our, in our graph. It's going to start to decrease in temperature. And it's going to decrease in temperature because the fire is physically putting itself out, is extinguishing itself because there's not enough oxygen to continue to growth. Now, at the bottom of that graph, it says fire department vents. And then the, the temperature of the graph shoots up. Fire department vents could mean several different things. The firefighters made entry through the front door. Maybe the firefighters broke a window. Or maybe they vented through the roof, but the second that a vent's created and the fire now has oxygen, you see a massive and rapid buildup in temperature until it quickly reaches flashover. And flashover is the very peak of that graph. Flashover is when everything in the room is now caught on fire and the fire is officially fully developed. And as the fire progresses, you see that the fire consumes all the materials in the room and the temperatures start to decrease because there's no more fuel to burn. The decrease is gradual because you're still going to have a large buildup inside the structure of heat. And then eventually you're at the decay phase. And as the fire decays, just because it's cooled off a little bit does not mean that the fire is extinguished. I want to cover flashover more. For flashover to occur, there must be high smoke loads, high fire gas loads, still inside the container with the walls and roof, and then most importantly, high temperatures. For a flashover event to occur, you have to have a vent source. 
that has to happen, an open door, an open window, or maybe the fire itself's already created its own vent source. Maybe it's burned through the roof and the ceiling of the house. Maybe the fire got hot enough in the room to break the windows. But you basically have to have unprecedented and unchecked growth and that fire is just putting off a massive amount of smoke and a massive amount of heat but it's still trapped inside that structure because of the walls and roof. Now as flashover occurs if you remember back on our explosive levels chart all those charts they reference, if you really look in the chemistry textbooks, they'll reference dip, different temperatures at which gases are flammable. And what will happen in a true flashover is that as the different materials in the room start to off-gas, they don't all catch on fire at the same time. What ends up happening is, is that you have one gas layer that catches on fire at a low temperature. And that gas layer that caught on fire, it's now burning and it's putting off heat. That heat's dumped into the next lowest gas layer and it starts to catch on fire. And then the next gas layer catches on fire and the next gas layer catches on fire. And as that smoke and those gas layers start to burn, you have a massive heat buildup inside the structure and that heat through radiant heat is just dumped into the room and everything else that was already off gassing steadily is just being amped up and it's going to be pushing a lot more temperature into objects they're going to absorb it and they're going to release a lot more gases and in a flashover event those of objects are going to catch on fire and it's it's you'll go online research it watch some videos and you will see almost all those objects catch on fire at the same time and it's because of the massive amount of heat that's being produced from the smoke burning inside the structure this is what it looks like inside a flashover event my question to you is, how do you survive this event? Do you think this event in this picture is survivable? My last question to you is, what is on fire? Please find one thing in this picture that's not on fire. And again, I can't reiterate this enough. Do you think this event's survivable? And do you think your gear can hold up to this? Another thing to consider if I, th if I tell you that every single flashover event is like this, is there any way that you can ever be prepared to survive this? Backdrafts. We're going to go in a lot more detail on backdrafts. The first thing that you need to understand on backdrafts, and this is mostly due to our area and building codes, backdrafts are going to be rare in this area, but that doesn't mean that they're impossible to have. Some recognition factors that have to be in place for a backdraft to occur. You have to have high heat, you have to have high fuel, you have to have high temperatures, and it has to be low oxygen levels. Now the first thing I want you to understand is a backdraft doesn't have to be in a sealed container. So let's say that you have an old shipping container that's sitting off to the side and there's a large fire that started inside of it. If I get the fire burning and going and then I close the door up, I'm going to limit the oxygen to that fire. And that fire itself is going to consume whatever oxygen's left in the trailer. And then from there, it's going to extinguish. Now, you got to remember, what are the factors for having a fire? The fire tetrahedron. All we have to have is oxygen, heat, 
and fuel. Now we've just turned the oxygen off, but we still have lots of heat. We have more fuel because we have lots of smoke in the air and we still have plenty of fuel inside that's at a burning temperature. It's still off gassing. The second that we open the door and the second that we allow oxygen to access that inside that container is the second that we're setting up backdraft conditions. You can also have a backdraft in a structure that has openings. It could be vented. The fire's so large and it's producing so much smoke, it's consuming the air, the oxygen inside the structure, and then it produces a massive amount of smoke and it pushes that smoke out, but then it consumed all the oxygen in the same process. So what it does is that air rushes in, the fire reignites, the fire takes back off, the fire pushes all the heat and smoke out, but all the oxygen's gone. So this time the fire takes literally another breath. And that's something that's a key factor to look for on backdraft situations, is you're looking for air that looks like it's being pushed out, and then it's being sucked back in. Look at the smoke column. The smoke column's pushed out, and then it looks like it's sucking back air. You see a very obvious laminar flow in that process. Tons of smoke pushing out the vent point, and a very thin stream of air trying to rush in. Look at the bottom of that stream the smoke what you're going to see is that stream's going to go up and down that layer is going to move it's going to travel so as the fire starts to burn nice and hot again a whole bunch of off gassing is created and the smoke starts to fill the structure so the layer is going to drop the smoke's going to fill up that ventilation point from there as the fire starts to extinguish itself air is going to rush in the layer is going to rise and then the process starts over again. Other key factors to watch for when you're trying to determine if there's a backdraft. You're doing the 360 on the building. You're sizing the building up. As you walk around the building, is the smoke venting from unusual places? It's one thing to have smoke vent from an open door. It's another thing to have smoke vent from a window or a gable vent or an eave. But what about the smoke venting in between bricks? A low point in the foundation, there's a crack and there's smoke being pushed out there. What about smoke just being pushed out the wall itself, maybe it's a wood-sided building and the smoke's being forced out in some narrow gap and it looks like it's obviously pressurized. That's a big clue that you potentially have a backdraft. Another key factor is, is when you look at the windows of the structure, are the windows tinted are the windows charred? Is it just you can't even see through the windows because there's so much soot on them? Maybe all the curtains and the blinds are completely missing out of the window because there was so much heat in the room, they all melted or already burned away. That's a big clue for a potential backdraft. Another clue, and it's sometimes hard to see on older construction, is if you literally see the walls moving, if the walls bowing out, and it's pushing in. Again, I used the reference of the fire breathing earlier. If you see those walls moving, in other words, you see no smoke, and the wall starts to swell, and then all of a sudden you see the walls start to collapse in on itself, and you're starting to see smoke push out, clues that the fire's trying to get oxygen. Now, the follow-up to this is... Now that you suspect a building actually has backdraft conditions, what do you do? I'm telling you, the first thing you need to do is say something on the radio. Let incoming units know that this is a potential backdraft structure. From there, you need to regroup with your company officer or command on scene and figure out a game plan. Once you've actually met with the company officer, you've got a couple of options here. You can vent from the roof, open it up, 
and start letting all that heat and smoke rise. Bring it up. Get it out of the structure. It's going to rise quick. It's going to vent fast. Another option is you can just open the front door. You can break a window out. Give it a vent source. We want it now to actually catch on fire and we want it to ignite. But here's my question to you. If the chief or command or your company officer says, I want you to go up to the front door and open it, and you suspect it's a backdraft condition, my question is this. What do you think is going to happen? What signs are you going to see when you open that door? As the firefighter is, you're getting ready to open the door or open a window, and you're suspecting a backdraft condition, this is what you should expect. We're going to assume that you're going to open the front door. Once the front door is open, you're going to have a massive plume of smoke push out really hard. Here's why. You have a huge heat buildup inside the structure. You have a huge smoke buildup inside the structure. And that smoke and heat is going to escape. So you're going to have a rapid push of smoke and heat out the front door. This is the time where you're going to back away. As you back away, you're going to wait for a very specific event to happen. And in this particular case, you want it to happen. You want the structure to catch on fire. You want it to flash over. Because once it's flashed over, the hazard's gone. Now you're going to extinguish the fire as normal. But as you're leading up to the flashover and you open the door, is the building just going to blow up? Is it a bomb in your face? No. Here's why. Think back on a couple of slides ago when we were talking about the fuel-to-air mixture ratios. You've got to have the proper amount of oxygen inside the structure before the fire can even reignite, much less catching the smoke on the structure back on fire. So as you open the front door and that massive plume of smoke and heat leaves, all of a sudden you're going to have an airflow that starts going into the structure. Where's that airflow going to go? That airflow has got to fill the structure, and it's going to get basically to the seat of the fire, the original point of ignition. And once you actually have enough air flowing in, you will reach a point because it's seeping in. It's slowly coming in. Once you reach the proper mixture, it's going to ignite, and it's going to either backdraft or it'll flash over. In the event that it backdrafts, here's the very specific event that happens. And we're going to take a second and stop, and we're going to look at what objects do as they're heated up. And when we look at a molecular level at something, and those atoms are heated up, they're going to start vibrating, and they're going to start moving, and they're going to start expanding. So in a backdraft, what happens is as that seat of the fire reignites, we know the room's superheated, we know all the gases in the room are superheated, we know the smoke's superheated, and what's going to happen is, is all those smoke particles, all those gases in the room, they're going to start to catch on fire, and they're going to start expanding because we know that things, when they're hot, expand and it's going to be a, a rapid chain reaction all that smoke is going to catch on fire and it's going to expand because of the massive heat influx and it's going to be a huge chain reaction this is the backdraft it's a literal explosion that's when the all the smoke in the room catches on fire at once and all the smoke inside that room expands at once and it's going to be a rapid violent expansion the backdraft will be an explosion now the explosion itself could be catastrophic to the structure or it could just scare the crap out of you but that is what you're looking for either the building is going to explode like a movie set into a million pieces or you're going to have a flashover and all the smoke in the room is now flashed and you'll be in a fully developed fire. But either way, what you're after is the flashover or backdraft. The last thing to add to this is time. 
don't forget, you originally have to give it a vent source, whether it's through the roof or through a window or through a door or for however you decide to vent the fire. Once you start to vent the fire, you have to give it the appropriate amount of time to get to the seat of the fire. And once you see a visible flame, once you see that visible flame start to turn into a flashover, and once the room itself is flashed over or backdraft, that's the point at which you're going to start normal fire ground operations. Now, the only last thing to add to this is a backdraft is a explosion. How close do you, should you actually be to that structure when you vent it? How close should you be to the structure as you're backing away from it when you're venting the structure? And the last part of this, how close should your apparatus be when you're venting a backdraft structure? Go ahead and write your answers down. Alrighty guys, we're actually getting close to wrapping this up with just a few more slides. I want to thank you for your time and patience. I know this is a longer class and I know we're throwing a ton at you. But the last thing that we want to look at is just the total event of a structure fire and the fire behavior It's as it's happening. And we're going to look at another graph here that has the flashover and backdraft combined in it. And what we're going to do is we're going to just start at the ignition point in the incipient fire, and we're just going to progress down this until we're through the decay phase. One thing I do want to add as we progress with this, if you recognize backdraft conditions, You've got to notify people on the radio, and you need to treat the structure as a loaded gun. You will be in backdraft operations. No interior tacks are going, and you want to get people prepared for the possible explosion of the house once it's vented. The other thing I want to add is, is assuming that you're working to the flashover. Again, remember, the flashover is the ticking time. We are trying to make entry, get to the seat of the fire, and extinguish the fire before flashover. Because if we're inside, we're dragging our feet, we're taking our time, and we're inside while a flashover occurs, we're in a very bad spot. Now, we'll talk about how to handle a flashover in the skills portion of the class. But for all intensive purposes, I want you to treat flashover as a life and death event. You better be proactive. You better realize what's happening around you. And you better be taking good attention to the atmosphere and prevent a flashover from happening. That may even require you cooling the atmosphere and backing out of the structure because the fire is too well advanced. Let's look back at our slide now. So we're going to start at our ignition point. And for this example, we're just going to say that someone fell asleep in a couch with a cigarette in their hand. And the cigarette has dropped in between the couch and the cushion. That's our ignition point. Now, the incipient phase starts the second the couch starts to catch on fire. And again, remember, all fires start small. But once the fibers in the couch catch on fire or the pleather or the leather, once those objects start to burn and once they start to give off smoke and once they start to generate heat and it is a sustained fire, then we're going to be in the growth phase. As the fire grows, the person on the couch is going to wake up they're going to get everyone else out of the house, and they're going to bail outside. They have their cell phones, they call 911, and we're now en route. When we get on scene, we notice that everyone's outside and the front door has been closed. We see heavy black smoke coming out of the roof fence, and we can see heavy black smoke right there at the front door. As we walk up to the front door, 
we're going to open it to make an interior attack. And remember, the fire was ventilation limited because the front door was closed. And for our example, all the windows and everything else is closed. So once we make entry in the front door, once the front door is open, the clock starts ticking again. As the crews are making entry, they're basically racing against two factors the incredibly rare backdraft or the flashover event in the flashover event remember you have to have high smoke high heat high fuel loads inside the structure but it's not oxygen limited so once the front door is open and you now have air flowing inside that's why we have the rapid heat buildup in such a short amount of time once the crews are inside, assuming that they back out, they back out, they can't find the seat of the fire, they keep noticing it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Once they back out, the fire will flash over. Once the flashover occurs and the smoke is burning, you are now fully developed. From fully developed, all the materials, all the fuels inside the structure have to be consumed and as the fuels are consumed the temperature will start decreasing and you are in decay phase if you have any questions about this graph please grab the instructors in your class grab someone at your department and get some more clarification on this subject i cannot emphasize this enough what firefighters are trying to race is the flashover. The flashover is the monster in the room. That is what we're trying to beat. That's what's going to potentially kill us if we're inside, but it's also going to potentially kill any victims that's inside. We are trying to beat flashover. Again, black draft awareness and paying attention to the structure and doing a good size up is going to help prevent any type of backdraft explosions when we're on scene. This video that's attached here is it's a little on the long side, but I want you to watch the video a couple of different times. Uh, this video is really good about showing when the structure is close to backdraft and once the training project is sealed up, and then what happens when they finally open the door to vent the structure. You'll notice it doesn't just explode in their face. They have to wait for the fuel to air mixture ratio reach a proper combustible level. Now the things I want you to notice while the video is playing, I want you to look at the smoke. Notice how it changes colors. I want you to look at how the smoke's pressurized as it leaves the container. There's a lot going on here. If you have any notes, write them down. And lastly, of course, if you have any questions, make sure you ask. Watch the video and enjoy. And after the video, come back. Now for everyone's favorite part of these modules. Time for the quiz. Today's quiz has got five questions. Question number one. How does a fire spread in a container or a structure versus how does a fire spread in a field? Wildland firefighting. Question number two. Why is it important for firefighters to control how much air is going into a container or the structure? Question number three. How can firefighters control airflow into a container or the structure? Question number four. Why do firefighters use water versus any other products on the market for extinguishing fires? Question number five. What event are firefighters trying to avoid? That is it for tonight. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you in the skills on Monday. Talk to you later. Hello and welcome back. 
I am Matt Hohan, Captain of Operations here at Granbury Volunteer Fire Department, and you're going to be participating tonight in our Granbury Volunteer Fire Academies Section 15 Fire Control. Of course, as always, you can always use SFFMA to reference any of your training in our slides, and fire control is just a preview of a lot of the burns that you're going to be experiencing on the department. Part of the requirement is, is that we have to prep you for the burns by discussing them beforehand, and that is the purpose of this very short section. So, here we go. We can go ahead and proceed to the next slide. Introduction. NFPA 1403, Standard on Live Fire Training Evolutions. This is a state and national requirement. Some of this stuff seems kind of mundane, but I got to go through it with you guys nonetheless. Identify the purpose of NFPA 1403. This is so that you have your junior woodchuck training before you're actually on scene. This is, if you just think of it from a basic manner, you're going to be a lot safer on scene if you've had some training before just showing up and trying to wing it. Define evolution. When we're doing an evolution, we are literally doing the skills. We are going through the class. Just like this module that you're doing online, an evolution is the skills portion. The definition, kind of obvious here, you're listening, that's going to be you. You're going to be the student. Define the instructor. Chances are, that's me or possibly someone else in the class. And then also, never forget about your instructors that you have at your home departments. Define training center and burn building. I know you probably haven't seen the training house yet or up there at our training field, but we do have a burn house, and it's pretty sweet. Identify subjects required prior to participating in live fire training. That's something that we will do before every evolution. Identify the minimum flow in gallons per minute required in each hose line used in live fire training. Our minimum flow rate is pretty simple. You look at your nozzle, it's going to tell you what PSI that hose has to flow at for maximum flow rates. Our nozzles, if you look at the tips of them, they'll have the gallonage writ right there. And it'll tell you 175 GPMs, 175 gallons per minute, at X amount of PSI. In this case, it's 50 PSI. So as long as that truck's flowing at 50 PSI, you're guaranteed to have 175 GPMs. Identify the protective equipment required during live fire training. This is going to be your structural gear. Now, if there's any equipment changes, the instructors will let you know before the fire. Control and extinguish the following live fires using the appropriate protective equipment, firefighting tools, and extinguishing agents. As students in our academy, you will train on a one-room fire, a two-room fire, a Class A combustible materials fire, a open pan combustible fire, that's a liquid fire, vehicle fires, and we will also cover ground cover fires or wildland. Horizontal ventilation during light fire training, again, this is just to let you know that we will teach you how to ventilate during a fire. In Hood County, we are a primarily a horizontal ventilation. It is rare that we will do vertical ventilation. We'll cover that, but we are a primarily a horizontal ventilation county. Raise ladders during life fire training, or at least during some time in training. Guys, our ladders class is extensive and thorough. Don't miss that night when we do have ladders training. Extinguish a Class B fire with a portable fire extinguisher. We will have a fire extinguisher class, and we're going to give you several different ways to extinguish a liquid fire using an extinguisher. 
Safety precautions to be taken at flammable or combustible liquid fire incidents. Just look at our picture here. You could already tell this is really bad news bears written all over it. The big thing I want you to look at is the flaming jet of fuel that's burning coming out of the tanker. What you really need to be concerned with with liquid fires is once it's burning, how the hell are you going to contain the liquid? My question to you is which way is the liquid going to go? Well, it's going to run downhill, and that may be a very hard area to contain. What if the fire's in the city and it's running down a gutter and it drops into a sewer drain? And it's been leaking for a long time before it finally does catch on fire. How big of a problem do we really have here? How big of an issue is this going to be to be able to extinguish it? Flammable fuels and fire is very dangerous and it's very difficult to contain those fires. We'll go into much more detail on our fire extinguisher night on this. How to use water to control Class B fires. Glass B fires are difficult fires to contain. They take a ton of water and what we're primarily going to be doing is cooling the vessel. The idea here is we're trying to prevent something that's called a blevy. B-L-E-V-E. -E, blevy. And I'm going to put another slide in here and go in much more detail on what a blevy is. The kicker for you is you need to realize you need a massive amount of water to fight a big class B fire because we're actually not trying to fight the fire what we're trying to do is cool the storage tank. A blevy fire boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion is a really unique condition and I'm going to attach a couple of videos or at least one for you guys to watch and I want you to understand that in the event of a potential blevy really the best case of action is going to be to back away. Some considerations to take is if you have a lot of apparatus and you have good water sources and you have the ability to use your master stream devices and cool that tank down, then what you can do is set your apparatus up, use unmanned master stream devices, and you just literally walk away from the fire. Let the trucks run, let the trucks pump, and let the hoses just set up and cool the tank. That is all we are after in a blevy. We are looking to cool the tank and keep the tank from exploding. Watch the videos and you'll get a much clearer picture of how bad blevies can be. Now on this slide we're going to talk about tank boil over. And if you thought a blevy was bad, just take a look at a tank boil over. It's not nearly as explosive, but it's, it's incredibly difficult to contain once it happens. Between the blevy and tank boil over, you'll have a whole new appreciation for these large vessels that hold oil or natural gas in these big cylinders that transport down highways. Go ahead and watch this video on tank boil over. Now, if you've watched both of those videos on boil over, the reason that happened is, is oil storage tanks can be open on the top. And what happened is, is water was spraying on top of the tank. The top of the tank isn't a sealed metal surface. It just basically has a big rubber mat that's on top. And that water gets on top of that mat. Well, the fire melts the mat. And what happens is, is, is water... When it's introduced to oil, does it sink or does it float on top of oil? Water sinks to the bottom. So as that tank's absorbing more heat and the oil's absorbing more heat, 
What does the water at the bottom of the tank start to do? Well, it's going to start absorbing heat. And the second that that water reaches 212 degrees, it's going to start boiling. And as water boils, it turns into a gas, as a vapor. That vapor expands 1,700 to 1. So what happens in a boil over is all that water at the bottom of the tank expands 1,700 to 1, and it rapidly rises. Well, as that air rises, and correction, as that water vapor rises, and it's expanding, what's it doing with it? It's taking a whole bunch of fuel, in this case oil, with it in smaller particles, and it's raising it up to the fire. So as the boil over occurs, it's a massive fireball that erupts from the top of the tank. Control a pressurized flammable gas container fire. So now that we have you questioning storage tanks and all different types of vessels, we're going to show you how to go fight it. Hello and thank you for joining us again. Fire Cause and Origin, Section 14. Guys, tonight this is a really short module. We're going to barely cover this. This is a fascinating subject, but for us and for a volunteer fire department, we're not really determining fire cause and origin. This is more of what our city fire inspector does, or in the county, our fire marshals. This is their job, but we're going to give you a brief overview of just exactly what they do. And again, in case you didn't recognize the voice, I'm Matt Hohan, Captain of Operations here at Granbury, and you've joined us for the Granbury Volunteer Fire Academy online training. Because I know I didn't say it earlier, this is Section 14, and you can always follow us on sffma.org. Explain the ways to recognize obvious signs of the area of origin. If you were in the mop-up stage of a fire, and you happen to notice a whole bunch of half-burned-down gas cans that's sitting in the living room, that's not normal. It's okay to alert someone that this is kind of suspicious. Other things that you may see that are unusual. It's just an unusual burn pattern. As you go to structure fires, you're going to realize what a normal burn pattern looks like. But if you get to a fire and you have a really good knockdown, and there's only smoke damage up top but there's on the ceiling, but there sure is a whole bunch of stuff burned in this particular corner on the floor, and it's just all the burning happened on the floor and in the carpet, that's kind of a clue that Maybe something was put on the floor to actually burn really hard. Doesn't necessarily mean it's arson, but definitely something worth letting an officer on scene know that you potentially found something suspicious. Describe the relationship between fire cause classifications and cause determination. Really what we're getting down to here is fire cause classifications. You either have a natural known cause of ignition, like a lightning strike, or potentially an electrical short, or, you know, just the heater was left on, a wood fire was burning, and that radiant heat caught the structure next to it on fire. The other classification is arson. It's suspicious. This isn't a normal looking fire. This fire wouldn't have started on its own. Now determination, that is where the actual investigators come in and they take the suspicious classification and they sort it into the determination, whether it's natural occurring or arson suspicious. Identify factors in indicating arson. Picture here is obviously a burn pattern on the floor and it looks like it was a liquid. If you thought about someone just having a big glass of gasoline and dumping it down on the floor, you know, that pattern on the concrete looks exactly like a liquid. Other indicators indicating it's arson. Again, the obvious cans of gasoline in the house. Uh, why on earth was so many electrical appliances intentionally plugged into one outlet and then 
you know, a trash can full of newspapers or whatever and, you know, 300 aerosol cans and a barrel of jet fuel was left all in the kitchen. Look for really obvious things. This, the really obvious things are usually the same thing that the investigators are looking for when trying to determine arson. Again, if you suspect something, let someone on scene know. Identify the importance of protecting evidence and explain the difference techniques of protecting evidence at a fire scene. A little bit of a longer slide here, guys. Um, the importance of protecting evidence. Well, how on earth is a fire investigator or the fire marshal going to be able to prove his case in court if you take the evidence and potentially just move it for him? Or better yet, personally take it to the station and show it off to everyone else. Protecting evidence is very important for the actual investigation that's going to take place. Now, explain the different techniques of protecting evidence at a fire scene. When you first discover something on scene that you potentially think is involved in a suspicious fire, don't just grab it, pick it up in the air, and start screaming and yelling, I found the key piece of evidence. Just leave it there, stand there, get on your radio, and call for a fire investigator or fire marshal to come over and let them start their work. What they're going to do is they're going to take pictures of it first in its natural state. You shouldn't disturb it at all, even if you disturbed it by accident. And then you discovered that this might be a potential piece of evidence. Tell the fire marshals that exact piece of information. It's okay. Your job is there to clean up the fire and extinguish all materials. And in the process, you accidentally found the evidence and you moved it. It's okay. Tell them that. Now, another critical factor in this, and this is just something for you guys to think about, how difficult is it for a fire investigator or a fire marshal to actually prove the arson crime? Take the time, next time you're on scene, talk to these guys and figure out exactly how hard it is to investigate and figure out how hard it is to actually take these cases to court. Now, the very last part of this, some real basic quizzes. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. In the event that you suspect you have an arson, who do you notify on scene? Second question. Assuming the fire marshal and fire investigators not on scene, who else can you contact to either call them or potentially get the person that might know how to actually contact them? Go ahead and think about how you would actually contact those individuals. And lastly, what are some other ways that you might be asked to protect a fire scene? Fire marshals and fire investigators may ask the department to do this for them. What do you think that might be?